Well, good afternoon, and uh, we welcome you to a, I guess, special edition, a, a snowed in, iced in edition of, of worship here at, at South End United Methodist. Uh, this was my first experience with what it means to attempt coming up this, this hill in an in inclement um, weather, and, and even with Chris at the helm, we got about a third of the way up, and it was like, nope, nope, this is not, not going to work, so... We, we parked over at the park and walked up, and, and Ernie did the same. I think you're parked at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> uh, so to try to not put too many people at risk coming up the hill, it's, uh, it's just us today and a little bit of a, a stripped-down version of worship on this first Sunday of Lent. But we're still trying to, to gather and, and, and prepare in, in this season of Easter and also to... Uh, we found probably the best way to make announcements is to put them out here in our worship services. So I guess for the first time we're saying that in, in two weeks, March 7th, we will uh, once again gather for in-person worship here at, at South End United Methodist on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. Um, we'll still be spaced out and we'll still wear masks and, and do things as, as safely as we can. Um, but as, as numbers head in good directions and as more and more of our family here are, are getting their first and second shots of the, the vaccine, it's, it's becoming a reality that we can gather once again um, in this space, in this place for, for worship. So in two weeks, we'll be back in here again. And next Sunday, we will gather in the Fellowship Hall for, for Sunday school as we begin our comparative work through the Gospels and, and the events of, of Holy Week. So we really wanted to, to come together and put something together so we could begin to put that noise and that news out uh, into our community and into the universe that it won't be long before we're back in here again, and I'm no longer doing this to cameras and, and microphones. It'll be to, to people and, and friends. So if you can stick with us for for two more weeks till we get back together in person. Um, that's really about it. I think that's about all, all I have. So we just thank you for, for making it through the snowed in week with us and, 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 and waiting a little bit longer on a Sunday for worship to be posted, but um, if this isn't the perfect embodiment of Lent. I don't know what, what might be. So we thank you as you join us this morning. Amen. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray, and holy manna will be showered all around. Standing on the promises of Christ the King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. 
Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. In many ways, our, our children's time this morning is, is once again inspired by this Lenten season we walk through. And uh, this is usually a time of year where people talk about giving something up for, for Lent by by giving up a something they enjoy, or usually you hear about people giving up TV for, for the Lenten season, or giving up coffee, or, or Coke, or, or chocolates. I don't know why all these things people give up. I'll start with C, but that's another conversation. But earlier this week, uh, Connie had mentioned how she'd had this conversation with Kai about what was Kai going to give up for, for Lent. And after much contemplation and and thinking about it, Kai said he was going to give up sticks for Lent. And she needed to ask, what do you mean by giving up sticks for Lent? And he said that, that when he would play with the kids in the neighborhood, they, they play with sticks as imaginary swords. And I immediately knew what, what Kai meant because that too was a huge part of, of my um, playing and, and, and friends. And on, on the playground, many an imaginary sword fight or, or lightsaber fight through the, the practice of, of sticks. Of course, with that came a lot of bruised knuckles and, and, uh, and other broken things around the yard. So my parents were never a fan of us playing sticks, as, as Kai would, would put it. And I know that's led into other conversations of Kai's wondering if, if maybe he should ever go back to playing with sticks even once Easter comes. And I think that's an interesting point on, on how to deal with Lenten practices. It doesn't always have to be giving up something you like. It could be the, the wedging of your foot in the door to give up a bad habit. It could be the beginning of maybe something you, need to, you know you need to stop doing. Or a Lenten practice could be adding something. It doesn't always have to be taking away. It could be um, adding a new discipline to your life. It could be adding um, more time for prayer or more time in scriptures or more time for, for meditation or maybe just the simple practice of Maybe that, that New Year's Eve resolution that you had that was such a great idea about six, seven weeks ago that has all of a sudden fallen by the wayside. Maybe Lent is the time to pick that back up and, and reinvigorate that, um, that goal, that resolution back again into your, into your life. So it doesn't always have to be subtraction. Lent can be an addition um, as well. So I would just challenge us to think about what are the sticks we are thinking about laying down or what are the practices we might be picking up um, in, this, in this time of preparation for Easter. Amen. My Jesus, I love I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin I resign my gracious redeemer my savior art thou if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary 
Our reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 9, um, which almost feels more fitting at the end of this week than it did at the beginning. It is at the end of, of the flood as, as Noah and the family and all the, the creatures are coming out of what has felt like their, um, their cage for, for 40 days and for 40 nights. I know for many of you, you are waiting for the, all the ice and, and snow to melt so you can uh, just get out of your house and see something different than maybe what you've seen all week. I heard somebody sit there and say they're just ready to eat something that they themselves didn't have to make, right? So whether that be a craving for, for pizza or, or Chinese or Waffle House or whatever it may, may be, you might feel like you too are walking out of the ark um, this afternoon or, or tomorrow. But that's besides the point. Let me get back to the scripture. Um, then God said to Noah and to the sons that were with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants that will come after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as that come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you and all future generations, that I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and and of all the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy them. When my bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and of all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, in the National Football League, before the, the draft, there is this, um, there's this event known as the NFL combine, or as many of us call it, the underwear Olympics. And, and for, for many prospecting college athletes, this is a series of, of tests and workouts and interviews that basically is the most important interview that they will have in their life to, to this point. It is a, a week-long battery of, of all types of tests and and evaluations as NFL teams and organizations try to figure out um, who they will select and draft to be future 
uh, franchise players and, and contributors to their teams um, in the years to, to come. So not only is this an evaluation process, but it's an important interview for those athletes because I guess multi-million dollar contracts are, are on the line. Nobody wants to be known as a NFL draft bust, and no NFL team wants to waste a, a high, uh, highly valued pick on, a, on an athlete that doesn't pan out. One of the large pieces of this series of tests, besides the 40-yard the dash and all the workouts, is obviously strenuous um, you know, medical evaluations and many physicals the athletes have to go through to, to be cleared by, by various uh, NFL doctors. One of the interesting, because the, the worst thing that would be would be to draft a, a player very high and then for that player to be injury riddled throughout their, throughout their career. So part of the process is having them go in front of many doctors and try to guess and, and weed out those who might be injury prone or, or might have risks of, of future injuries. Well, this is an interesting process because when that college athlete sits in front of that NFL team doctor, they go into their entire athletic and medical history all the way back to, to high school and, and before. And they rank all the athletes on a scale from one to, to five, one, one being the worst and, and five being the best. But there's an interesting practice in this ranking system is that if you have had any major surgery, any major joint reconstruction, whether that be an ACL tear or a meniscus surgery or a torn labrum in your shoulder, any major surgery to that point, the highest score you can get on this continuum is a three. It might have been a shoulder surgery you had as a freshman in high school, which at this point might be seven or eight or nine years ago, but if that is on your record, the highest score an NFL team doctor, doctor can give you is a three. And that is because the, the powers that be in these organizations have found that the best indicator of future injury is the presence of prior injury. The best indicator of what might happen is to take a look at what has happened. So in many ways, I think our, our journey into Lent and, and our experience with God is not too awful different than these NFL team doctors. As we go into Lent and the experiences of Holy Week, we in many ways are taking a step back and maybe doing our own evaluations on our own face life and, and projecting how, how we process and, and react to the events of, of Easter that are coming quickly down the road. Trying to figure out what lies ahead, what might happen, and are we ready for those happenings when, when they come down the road. Well, maybe over the past few weeks as we've worked and talked and walked through the Gospel of Mark, maybe you've found conversation partners in the characters of, of Larry, Moe, and Curly. I, I mean, James, John, and, and Peter. Um, because they too have, have witnessed and heard the, the miracles and the teachings of Jesus, but they still find themselves confused. There's part of them that still doesn't know what to do, how to, how to predict or how to evaluate this, this character of Jesus. We know that and, and how they reacted or, or didn't react or, or stumbled um, throughout the stories of, of the Lord's Supper and prayers at Gethsemane and, and the crucifixion, death, and burial of Jesus. We continue to set and celebrate these days as, as separate, set-apart holy days in our life today to prepare for and to see how we would react year after year. So we prepare for them even though there's almost no way to prepare for the hard realities that those days speak to and call us to remember. 
try as you might, nothing can really prepare you for when you experience your own holy Saturday. The space of darkness that fills the space between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. But yet we still prepare for that void. We still project and evaluate where our faith stands in terms of being ready for that question, of being ready for that reality. Once again, maybe the best indicator of future events and reactions might be found in the past. The best way to know what God will do might be to look back and remember what God has done. The best way to project relationships with God might be to reflect on past relationships with God. This is actually exactly where our Lenten journey starts this lectionary year, is reminding us by what God has already done before. These opening weeks of of Lent take us back to these agreements and covenants that God made with with Noah and Abram and, and Moses. Because the best indicator of what God might do next is to take a look at what God has done before. If we go back to that trajectory metaphor that I seem to keep playing with, you can can look at a trajectory and predict where it might go next by what the ark has already looked like before. What we read this morning in in Genesis 9, albeit very what felt like a a repetitive set of sentences, is, is the covenant that God made between Noah and all flesh. And this word covenant is a big word and a big phrase of of Old Testament understandings, and I would say New Testament understandings as, as well, because covenants were understood to be like legal documents, and they were drenched in this these legal metaphors and understandings, although that very quickly makes us think of, of quick pro quo language. Like you scratch my back, I'll I'll scratch yours. The covenant with Noah is is a little different. Covenant with Noah is free of all reciprocal promises. Covenant with Noah is void of any type of responsibility on our end. It It is God's promises on God's own volition. In many ways, this is a whole lot like the promises that a a church community makes when they celebrate a baptism. Think about the questions and promises you make to that newly baptized member that's coming into your church, whether it be an infant or a teenager or an adult. There are questions we ask the community, and, and those questions are promises that are made without looking for anything in return. Very similar to the promises God is making here in the opening chapters of Genesis. The moment where the God who blesses and and the God who promises come together in this story and lay together the foundations of the future for all the world that is to come. In many ways, the promises and the foundation that this covenant lays provides the foundations for all covenants and agreements and relationships with God that will follow to be built upon. We see in the covenant with Noah a stream of reasoning and consciousness that will exist in all covenants from this point forward. All covenants will be directed to the same end, the good of all creation which God has already intended. There's something powerful in this this freely promising and blessing God who's not looking for anything in return. 
See, many traditions and understandings of God have, have painted God as this stoic, unmoved mover. You've heard the reference of, of God being a, a clockmaker, somebody that set the wheels of creation in motion and then sits back and just watches the clock do its work. That's not the God we see in the flood story. God regrets. God grieves. God remembers. And God sets God's bow in the clouds so that God will remember the promises He made on this day. A brilliant rabbi would use the this story of, of God and the character of who God is in this story and would rather define God as the most moved mover. That sounds a little prevenient if you ask me. We see the story of a God that, that reaches out, the story of a God that moves first, the, the story of a God who does the heavy lifting. So please, if nothing else, this Lent, look into these stories of the Old Testament. Find that God had an incarnational side of His being even before the story of Jesus took root. God has always desired a relationship with and has been moved by the suffering of humanity. But God doesn't even limit God's self in the story to that point. The story of Noah is the story of a God that is not withdrawn from creation, but is instead the story of how God is now almost more universally and inclined and involved with creation and all the created order from this point forward. That There's part of making this promise that almost God is promising that, that He'll try His best to make sure that the that the, the train never gets this far off the tracks again that we have to get to this point. I want to rewind you to a little sentence that we, we tend to forget, that somehow we have forgotten and skipped over in this opening covenant of God. And it's that God is making this promise to be in relationship with, to want to save all flesh, all of creation, the entirety of flesh on earth. Everything that is seen or unseen, what can or, or couldn't be touched, love, image, emotions, thoughts, atoms, and oceans, all of it is what God is promising to be in relationship with. Just makes me wonder where where did we get any of these claims of, of exclusivity when when nine chapters in God writes this initial promissory note in regards to all peoples, and not even peoples, all flesh across the earth. It's interesting to think that, that inclusivity has somehow become a, a buzzword in, in the modern church. A buzzword like it's a new issue, but when I read this book, you, you can't even get past the opening book without seeing the acts of an inclusive God. You can't even get out of the first book without seeing that the original promise was always towards a trajectory towards and built around inclusivity from the very jump. So when we ask questions like, is your church inclusive? It almost hurts. How did church, how did an exclusive church become the norm? How did an exclusive country club of God become the accepted practice to where questions of inclusivity are, are breaking with somehow a created tradition? And the same could be said for the word reconciling as, as well when we ask the question, is, is your church a reconciling church? And I, I just want to ask back to those questions, is there any other type of church? Isn't the very original blueprint to be an inclusive, reconciling, 
loving church, how, how have we become anything else? And if we have become anything else, maybe the journey this land is to take a step back and, and to, since if we're going to try to figure out what we're supposed to be as God's church going forward is to take a step back and look at what God's already done. Maybe somehow along the lines we, we broke and forked off from that trajectory. Is there any other kind of church than an inclusive, reconciling church? I mean, obviously there is, but I don't know how we got there. In the ninth chapter of this book, we see the most moved mover making a promise of inclusive, universal salvation with all of creation. While this might be extraordinary or a radical statement to make today, it is by no means the only biblical reference we get to this, this desire for salvation with God. Eugene March would, would write in a book entitled The Wide, Wide Circle of Divine Love, A Biblical Case for Religious Diversity. And he would write in this in a way that he reviews a range of Old Testament texts that speak to God's ultimate plan for universal salvation. And this argument would begin with Genesis 9. Walter Berugamon, who would also actively engage in this subjects would, would take the, the promise made in here in Genesis 9 and, and connect it to the, the work of Amos and, and Amos 9-7 in which Israel is told and, and instructed surprising news that Yahweh might be engaged with, in, you know, let me say it again, that might be engaged in exoduses with other people that they don't know about just yet. The minor prophet is, is breaking the news that your God might be, might be taking other people through that Exodus story that you know so well and, and practicing it and giving it to them in a new form, in a, a new way. And how do you receive that word that God might be at work in other people's the same way he has been at work in you? There's many other countless references to this inclusive, uh, outward-reaching work of God. That Isaiah would talk about Egypt and Assyria in the same breath as Israel. That he would talk about that all these nations would join together and worship and work together for the good of Yahweh's vision for the world. And I could go on and list, we could talk about Syrian generals of Naaman and and, and, and Ruth, people that were outside of, of the family being brought into the bloodline of, of Jesus, but it's simply a reoccurring theme which shows up in a variety of texts all too often for it to be a coincidence. And I know we tend to think that this loving, inclusive God was something new in the New Testament. Somehow we've, we've accepted this belief that God like took a nap at the end of Malachi and woke up in a distinctly better mood by Luke 22 and all of a sudden was talking about a table which everybody was invited for. And that's just simply not right. Because that open table we see in Luke 22, well, it's technically the same table God had been building all the way since Genesis 9. It's not a new idea in the New Testament. It ripples over and over and over again throughout the Gospels and the epistles that follow. It's all too easy to see that God's universal salvation is not a sidelight or a sideshow, that it is bound inextricably to the work of Jesus and is stated repeatedly in unequivocal terms. Us, just like the disciples, have heard this news, have heard this teaching countless times, and still somehow we have built exclusive country clubs of God's people. So what we have today, 
and the foundational covenantal relationship with God through Noah is that we find that we all can be saved. That even nature and all flesh and all created beings within it has always been a part of God's salvation. This brings us to the rainbow. The rainbow is a sign of God's covenant, is a symbol of God's patience. God's bow is in the clouds and it is rounded. We are reminded that a rounded bow is a strung bow taut with tension. Yes, God is patient, but something about God's patient is still a little tense and wound and, and bound up. God is patient, but there is energy in this patience. The profession of colors of the rainbow might stand to tell us about the infinite resources and edges of God's love. These infinite resources would be used in God always finding a way to defeat evil without waging war anymore. As we travel through Lent, I ask us to travel through Lent with God's rainbow-colored viewing glasses on to look at the world, allowing us to go on even in the midst of our mistakes ever since, but our mistakes are only matched by God's own commitment to patience, peace, and suffering alongside us. We know where we're going this Lent. And that we know that Jesus' resurrection is the promise of a new life. But in many ways, this new life is the fulfillment of the promise of God's rainbow. It is the fulfillment of God's want for creation and life and a life-giving peace and harmony that God desires for all of us. So this Lent, we look at this world through rainbow-colored glasses and remember the promises we've always had. And not just promises for ourselves and our community and our corner of the world, but promises that exist for all peoples, all flesh, and all creation. With our rainbow-colored glasses on, May we once again throw ourselves at and rediscover God's mercy and become God's people again. Amen. Let us bow our heads in, in prayer. And just pray for continued safety in, in this weather, not only just in our neck of the woods here, but in other states. Pray for ongoing vaccination and health and safety for, for all who have lived and survived through this time. We pray for many concerns and thoughts and needs that we really can't say publicly to put out there for all the world on YouTube, but we know that we are lifting our voices and our hearts in prayer together. So let us pray this morning. Lord, we come to you and we are so thankful that we have stayed warm and safe in this time of tumultuous weather. We thank you for getting a few of us up the hill this, this morning to, to still participate and, and worship. We're thankful that the reality of us gathering together again is getting closer and closer and closer. We lift up those who have suffered without power and warmth through these storms. We lift up and encourage and empower the people who have continued ministries to, to people without homes without the safety of food and friends and family. 
you give them the energy to keep doing your good news and spreading your good works. Lord, we pray for all the leaders and decisions that need to be made and the the weeks and months forward as we continue to to rebuild and get back on our feet and, and learn to walk without a limp again. In the meantime, we continue to pray the same way you taught your early disciples by saying, Our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. O oh Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds Thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout The universe displayed when through the woods and forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grand Hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing He bled and died to take away my sin When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art We begin this journey of Lent. We begin walking to the unknown of the cross year after year, thinking how will we prepare and respond this time. As we seek those responses, we seek the answers to life's unending questions. Maybe we can find them and the promises that God has already made, and the peace and love that God has already promised. That could be the best indicator of future trajectories that could be found in what God has already done. God 
God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet. Till we meet. Till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet.